It is currently zero degrees Fahrenheit where I am. So this is, you're, you get a rare occurrence, a super, super rare occurrence of something covering my hair. I, I don't usually wear hats or, or stuff like it. Uh, not because I'm opposed, but it's just rare. It kind of, it makes my head itch, frankly. But uh, so do, do what you want. I would freely and happily uh, love memes that come out of this if you think of any. I don't know, but notice that it's a Michigan beanie. Um, by the time I release this, it's probably been a little while since Michigan won the national championship in football, but as always, go blue. You know, Seth and I went to Michigan, as we've mentioned countless times, but I mention it all the time, especially on the basis of the fact that hey, Michigan just beat Washington in the national championship about a, a week ago for me as I'm recording this. Um, but that's not what prompts this video. That's not what this topic is. The topic of this video is the nature of conversion and testimonies and, and what makes a, a conversion, so to speak, valid. Um, I had a friend who, who had like a, a short Instagram video that he made about how a lot of Christians uh, unfortunately despair over hearing these miraculous testimonies and conversions. Um, and when they think, when they look back at their lives, like I, nothing crazy happened to me, they think, well, am I really a true Christian? Or at least am I as good a Christian as the other people? And of course he, he said, well, of course you are, you are a Christian. Um, you know, regardless of how crazy your testimony stuff is. Um, and of course, let's let's just assume all of the, the claims of most of these conversions are true. Um, and a lot of them, they don't have to be like miraculous in the sense of like supernatural, um, you know, in the modern sense of it. They can just be ones like, like I have a friend who um, he, you know, did a ton of crazy stuff. He just was in a lot of horrible things. And then I, I don't, he just suddenly came to Christianity. The Holy Spirit gave him faith out of nowhere. And now he is really, I mean, Christianity is the core of his life. So yeah, that's a story that I would consider to be pretty crazy, even though you wouldn't say, oh, here's a supernatural miracle or something like that in the sense of like, oh, an angel came and said something. And that's, you know, we, we say that it, conversion is a miracle and that the Holy Spirit works, um, you know, through the means of grace, uh, including the word, of course, um, and give somebody faith. That's not something we can do. And in that way, it's miraculous because it's an immediate work of God. Um, well, I won't say immediate work of God because, of course, the means of grace are mediations or, uh, you know, immediate causes. But it, it's um, more immediate than like standard events of second causality or secondary causality. Um, God is not as remote in the case of the means of grace as he is in like standard general causality. This is the distinction between uh, general and special providence, for example. Um, now, as part of this, uh, we talk about how in, in the evangelical world there's a lot of emphasis on testimony and conversion. Um, people talk about like, when did you become a Christian? They look for like maybe a specific date. What was your, what's your story? What's your, what's your conversion story? Um, I'm actually, you know, more open to that stuff than I think a lot of Lutherans that I find are. Uh, not because I think we can, you know, track down our, our date to a decision for Christ. You know, I oppose decision theology. Um, you know, I'm gonna trace my step back to my baptism, frankly. But um, because I think that we, now, we can generally make statements as to when were the moments at which the Holy Spirit worked in you that moved you towards the faith. So, you know, even though, let's, let's say, you know, someone goes to church for the first time and, and the Holy Spirit grants them faith, we aren't going to be opposed to them in saying, well, it was on this day that I received faith. We're going to, you know, maybe oppose the language of this is the day I made my decision for Christ. But nonetheless, we're not going to be like, oh, it's vague and nebulous. Even though you weren't baptized, this is, you know, you, you weren't baptized this day, so we nothing happened. No, we can still say that faith was granted in you. And in that way, you, you became, um, even in a limited sense, uh, a Christian. Um, you not received baptism, the fullness, you know, of the gifts of God in that way. But nonetheless, the I, I think salvation occurs at that point. Um, Again, I, I'm not trying to get to a whole baptismal debate here, but suffice it to say that, you know, I, I I think that discussions of testimony and conversion actually can be beneficial. I think sometimes it's a bit overused in a lot of evangelical spheres in that I've seen it like replace the preaching and not in a way where it's like, oh, hey, you, you have a you have a testimony and then they explain, well, I received the gospel. Here's the gospel for you, because, you know, Paul and other Christians do that early on, obviously. But sometimes I've seen it where it's just like, oh, here's the entire story of their testimony. And that doesn't have anything necessarily to do with the audience beyond, oh, you know this guy and here's, you know, what it is. Again, I'm not opposed to that actually, but I'm more so opposed to it in the fact that it re may replace preaching. Ah, oh, it is so bumpy here. I'm sorry, guys. 
it is really shaky. These roads are bad right, right now. Um, I don't think it affects audio though, so that says it matters for these videos. Um, anyway though, he, my friend talks about how a lot of these, a lot of Christians live normal lives. A lot of Christians, including myself, we grew up in the faith. Um, you know, I, I, I was kind of leaning towards agnostic in, in high school in some ways. I mean, I was, I was Christian, but I was, I'll put it this way. I wasn't necessarily leaning agnostic, but I was becoming more fideist. And I lost a lot of confidence in the faith. But like, I never truly apostatized in my mind. I mean, a lot of Christians are the same way. Maybe they, maybe they leave the faith in return. Maybe they just stick in the faith that their parents taught them and so on, where their events are not considered miraculous. Um, and it can go in two ways. Um, in one way, like, like this can have two psychological effects uh, on um, people. Uh, one, that are bad, of course. Some people are just like, oh, cool, I have a normal experience, it's fine. Yeah. But the people that despair over it, potentially, they, or they, can, they consider themselves different Christians than those who have miraculous testimonies or, or conversion events, um, they can either go in this way of like, well, maybe I'm not a true Christian. You know, maybe I didn't really receive it the way that these people did. And I've seen that happen. I think this happens a ton when you really start emphasizing one's conversion experience as the test of one's of one's faith and one's genuineness, so to speak, for the Christian religion. Um, you know, it, I've talked about this before that in that way, I think sometimes you pervert the efficacy of faith from uh, the fact that it grasps the merits of Christ and it's an instrumental cause into its own efficient cause by saying, well, it, depending on how genuine your faith is, which often is conflated with your feelings, you know, that's, that's how you determine the, the, the salvation that you have. Um, so that's one way is it's utter despair. And the, and the Christian does not need to despair in that way. It's really unfortunate that some people do because all, all salvation, like all conversions, whether, whether it's in baptism as an infant, whether it's in just, a slow, gradual process where you start going to church and yeah, this, this stuff makes sense. All of it is miraculously performed by God through the means of grace, whether, you know, usually in, in the word directly, right? Um, and so every Christian conversion is a miracle in some way. It really is. And I think a lot of this is, I think it's neglected. I think part of that is because there's a downplaying as to how sin is. And part of that I think is because of decision theology. You know, there's kind of this implicit idea that when someone is really, really stuck in these visible sins, like, like just being absolutely addicted to really hardcore drugs, um, and just destroying themselves or, you know, horrible, horrible gambling addictions, or, you know, I don't know, being like a prostitute doing all these things are just crazy. You can look at that, these external things, you can say, oh, this clearly is blinding somebody and had these sinful effects that they needed peeled back by God. But you'll look at like the average person who, let's say they don't have any crazy addictions, they just work an office job, and they're just a normal person who has their life in general together. And you can say, eh, that person doesn't need their, their layers pe peeled back by God and a miraculous, um, you know, transformation of the heart from a heart of stone. A lot of people think that, you know, the latter, the latter case, eh, you know, you're, you're not as depraved as this other person. I mean, there's a sense in which, you know, maybe, maybe you're, you're following the external law better than the other people, the people with the more heinous addictions. But nonetheless, you are just, you are in as much need of conversion from God as those people who have more externally dangerous and um, sinful actions. So I think that's one of the things, and it comes down to a, a downplaying of the nature of sin and the nature of depravity. Another way, it does the same thing. An another um, direction, another psycho potential psychological effect that you can have is somebody says, ah, you know, I, I didn't need it then, you know, in a similar way. So the first way is this kind of negative, like maybe I'm not truly a Christian, um, you know, because I wasn't, you know, brought from a horrible place to a, to a great place, a phenomenal place, or it can lead kind of, you know, to a similar conclusion, um, but with some differences in that you say, well, similarly uh, with, uh, with uh, conclusions about depravity, maybe I, I didn't need it as much. Maybe I was good enough before. I, you know, I, I don't need to, to be saved as much as the other person. So in both cases, you have a situation where the, the effects of sin are downplayed and the necessity of salvation 
is downplayed. But in one case, you have this like despair because you question the genuineness of the faith. And in this other side, you can have people who um, say, well, maybe I didn't need as much as other people and I, I'm just that good. Um, and I don't think people are going to say that explicitly, but that's one of those effects that you have um, maybe implicitly or, or in the mind. Uh, you know, I think Wolf Mueller talks about this a lot, not as much with the sake of con uh, with conversion, but with, you know, um, daily repentance where you either have pride or despair. You know, if you're if you're properly fighting sin, you're doing really well. You know, you're let's say that you have certain addictions and you're you're like breaking out of them. Then you may have pride. Like, I, I, I am amazing at this. I'm fighting my sin well. Um, and I truly am a Christian or somebody who is consistently struggling with it, fighting it yet some days just isn't winning, they might say, am I really a Christian because I struggle with this? And that there are these kind of, the, the pride and despair, um, you know, the spectrum of it, so to speak, is is real, um, I think, for a lot of people. And we see it not only in following, like, the law in sanctification, the third use, um, and the second use, that matter, um, but also simply in one's own conversion. Uh and so with that in mind, I mean, what, what is kind of the, the Lutheran position on this? And well, for one, I want to say that the evangelical position in my mind does not absolutely necessitate that one have despair or pride in this way. Is it a very, very, very common psychological effect? Yeah. Um, sorry about that. I just had to, you know, tell somebody they can, you know, pull in. Um, getting gas here, but you know, is it a very possible psychological effect I think occurs a lot? Yes, I see it all the time. But I don't think that somebody should say as an evangelical, oh, I didn't have a, a conversion like this other person, therefore either I'm better or I'm worse than them. I don't think that an evangelical has to think that way. I really don't. Um, it's not something in their system that absolutely must occur on the basis of the axioms of evangelical theology. Is it super common in the way that like a lot of practice is done? Like a lot of the the, the stories of, of conversion and testimony are put out there and a lot of the emphasis on decision theology is, is done, yes. But I think there are ways that it can be reformed and in a way kind of stopped. I think a lot of people can fight it. And I mean, frankly, the friend of mine that, that you know, inspired me to talk about this, he's an evangelical guy. So he recognizes it. And I don't think he does in, in a way where he's like going against his theology. I think he totally recognizes something that a lot of evangelicals are starting to notice, um, at least from my experience and with talking with them and even just seeing it, um, you know, online or even, or even in person. I think a lot of people are starting to recognize it and that's a good thing. Um, so, you know, on, the, on the, the other side of this though, I do think, I do really appreciate the evangelical willingness to be very open about their actual conversions. I, one of the only things that I really have seen that's been unfortunate as a Lutheran, one of the only things that I've experienced where I'm like, really? Like, this is something I think would be better is almost this this hush-hush nature as to one's um, spiritual journey, so to speak. I find a lot of people just hiding what sins they've dealt with. Um, a lot of people who are not willing to necessarily share what happened in their life that led them to Christianity. Um, a lot of the time it's, it's so against as Lutherans, we're so against feelings and, and the individualism that we see in evangelicalism that we go so far and almost deny that, well, you converted one means or another, or by one way or another. Um, so I think that's actually something we could learn from the evangelicals. Now, I, again, I think sometimes they go too far with it, but I think on the whole, like having these open discussions about, you know, how does one convert or, or um, what was one's exact conversion can totally be adapted into Lutheranism in one way or another with the modification that um, and the clarification that it does not need to be this crazy experience. It can be something completely normal. Um, and you can still root it in the means of grace. I think that, you know, for example, a Lutheran, if you were to ask them, well, I, I talked about my own conversion, but let's talk about somebody who came from like atheist to just straight Lutheran. They could totally say, well, I was a heathen. Uh, I, I committed these certain sins. I did not think they were sins or something in the back of my mind um, told me something was wrong, but I didn't openly think they were wrong. Um, and then I was invited to church by a friend of mine. I was curious about it and I heard the word of God and it showed me my sin and I heard the gospel and God granted me faith. That is a totally valid thing to say. It does not go against Lutheran theology and I think there is a place for it. So, uh, that's really what I have to say. Um, thanks for listening and, uh, I hope this, you know, leads to further discussion on this kind of stuff. So thanks. Hey everyone. Thanks for watching another Scholastic Lutherans video. If you'd like to support us, you can follow us on Twitter at Gerhard's Ghost, 
or contribute on Patreon at Scholastic Lutherans. There you'll get access to our Telegram chat and other perks. Links can be found in the description. Subscribe, like, or leave a comment, and have a nice day.